God, we thank you for the moment that we uh, are able to be together in this time. Thank you for creating us as we are meant to be and for that journey for so many of us in discovering who that is, who we are, who you are, and claiming the goodness of your creation in and of us. In your name we pray. Well, we are going to uh, continue the discussion of Unclobber. It's mainly our purpose of gathering today. Um, and uh, we're looking at chapters 9 and 10, if that means anything to those of you who have the book and are reading it. If you aren't doing that, haven't been, and you just want one to like follow along if we name a page or something, even though I'll try to read those things. There are two extras back there on that that table that had the fish tail, but the fish tail is not there. So it's right back there. <laughs> so that's in the back. If you need a book. So the verses that Colby is closing the book with, he's gone in biblical order <laughs> as far as the, what he's looked at. They are actually, I'm going to read them both. They're on page 155, if you have the book. If not, there we go. If not, uh, Listen, just listen. So, um, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Paul writes, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, and adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. That's from the uh, New American Standard Bible. And then 1 Timothy 1.8 from the same version of the scripture of the English translation says, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers and brothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. And uh, in the book, Colby spends a lot of time looking at two words. Malakoi, and, I have to look at the second one more, there we go, arsenokoitis, something like that. Arsenokoitai, that's it, arsenokoitai, I would say. So, looking at malakoi first, um, which is translated in the, two, in the scripture that I mentioned, or that I read, as in that version as effeminate. And so, uh, I'm turning too many pages there. Malakoi, which appears in, the, in that list in uh, chapter 7. Do you not know, again, it says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor malakoi. Malakoi. And that word was used in three ways, he says. In its most basic form, it, it just simply means soft. As a matter of fact, it's used in the scripture, he mentioned several times, that it's used several times to talk about soft cloth. So that is its, its actual literal meaning. Um, and then it's used as soft, and then it's 
beyond that literal usage, it's also used in a moral context to describe someone who was spineless. And then another way was as a, he used the word pejorative sense to describe a womanly man. Which, he points out, in the con that cultural context was a disgrace in a male-dominated patriarchal society. Um, he says it goes beyond someone being weak-willed and moves into describing the person as being like a woman, which was seen as even worse. So some translators use the word effeminate to communicate this idea of being um, manly. So there are three ways that it's used in the scripture, three ways it's been understood and translated, depending on the context that it shows up in, in the Greek. The other is um, there is. the one arsenicoid time, and it is translated as homosexual in many English translations. Now, we had a conversation once before it came up, one Sunday we were talking about this, that, um, and, and before, well, before I go there, uh, I like what Colby said, he said that using the word homosexual or uh, malakoitai, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> I knew I'd get this confused, arsenikoitai, is, um, it just should not happen. He said, as a matter of fact, he makes the statement, that it's a modern term and shouldn't be in the Bible. Because they did not have an understanding of um, orientation. Just, you know, just acts. Um, and so he said it just should not be. It did not show up in the Bible. And I think you were telling us that, oh, this went on a missional community event. So, so you didn't hear it. I'll not hear it. The show brought up that in 1946 is the year that translators uh, worked on the new, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, which has been like my favorite forever. Um, and the new Revised Standard Version came out in the 80s. But they were, it was the first folks to translate that word homosexual. It did not appear in the Bible until 1946. So there's a lot of, uh, there's some work and research around, you know, uh, how that happened. The committee has, actually I've heard if I'm not mistaken, uh, and it was a committee, the committee that translated the Revised Standard Version has said, yeah, we think we made a mistake. But I also find that unfortunate that they've never said broadly that we think we made a mistake. They told the creators that there's a, a movie that's being made has been made in 1946, it's called, about that, and about the translation of the scriptures around these passages in that way in particular. Um, it hasn't been, I don't believe it's released yet, I keep looking for it, but I keep seeing that they're still trying to raise money to either get it finished or to, to get it released. Uh, and, and anyone can donate to that, by the way, so if you want to Google 1946 the movie, and uh, you can you can help <laughs> get that started or finished. I mean, so. all right. Um, I think it was interesting too that this word uh, arsenikoitai. Uh, Colby said no one knows what it means. No one really knows what it is. Uh, it's Paul made it up. It's, it's, I don't think it shows up anywhere else. Um, and he says, you know, we just don't know. So I'm going to pop, I mean, certainly interrupt me anytime with a question. But anybody have any other, anything that you, you, know, you, if you read the book or if you just heard me talk about those couple things, anything that came to you that you want to share or just thoughts about that or reflections or just reactions? This was the most complicated of the 
discussions, I think. Kathy said this was the most complicated of the discussions of the other of the past. To, to me, it was. Yeah. To it was a more technical intent. When he talks about so be like this, is what it's really saying. You know, and, uh, oh, there we go. I didn't mark it. That was. It. <laughs> Jesse says, Paul condemned with his use of malakoi I and it, as we'll see, uh, our sinekoi and his vice list were same-sex sex acts that were exploitive and transactional. Um, he invited the Corinthian church to embody a community. It's on page 160 if you have the book at the bottom. He invited the Corinthian church to embody a community that was holy, set apart from the culture around them, similar to how Levitical law called Israel to not commit um, toba or you know, other exploitative acts. This separation of behavior would have been crucial to Paul's church planning experiment, especially in a city like Corinth. Corinth was a wild place. <laughs> it was a crossroads. It was a, uh, a trade town. It was a crossroads of trade from all over and all kinds of cultures and people groups uh, of, uh, lived in Corinth cross paths in, in Corinth, and uh, so it, it really was quite a, a unique place. Um, so, so he says this way, no, says Paul, it says, uh, what he's saying is that they were to be different. God, through Jesus, was calling them to, he's talking about Corinthian Christians trying to figure out how to live in this place. And all of them probably coming from lots of different backgrounds as well. He said, Jesus was calling them to a better and new way of living. One where people don't solicit for sex. One where people don't treat their bodies as a commodity. One where people don't treat others' bodies as a commodity. One where people are respected and honored, not used as property. One where people do not use power and privilege to take advantage of those below them. That's what he's trying to get across. In the, in the bigger picture of what's being done, so, or what's being said. So any other thoughts about that? Are you going to talk about the section about units? Yeah, you, you can start it if you want. Kathy asked if I was going to talk about the section on units. Yes, I am. So. Um, yes, <laughs> Unix. <laughs> Unix. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, all right.
heard any of that if you read the book, and if you didn't, hang tight, I'll get into that. Yeah, so, um, there's this story <laughs> um, in Acts chapter 8 in particular about uh, eunuch and, and specifically, uh, which I'm going to get to in a minute. But um, So, there were several kinds of eunuchs. Anybody read it and want to say what they are? You're like, I never thought I'd be talking about this in church. Man-made. What's that? Man-made. Man-made eunuchs? Right. Yes, who were like cast free. Yeah. And then, uh, for whatever reason, they were part of the court. Yeah. And so they, you know, it was safer for the harem of the king or the queen uh, to have Each men side. serve them that were cast free. And, and what? They were natural made. Natural made. Yes. Didn't care, didn't have any affiliation to women. Yeah, they didn't have any affinity or draw, you know, uh, attraction. attraction to women. It was a natural made eunuch. So, yeah, and he even reads the scripture or talks about where Jesus refers to both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was interesting. It was interesting. It's in Matthew 19. He said, not everyone, let me see, uh, I'll, I'll go back and read the context that Colby writes it. In Matthew 19, Jesus was engaged in a dialogue with Pharisees about divorce and remarriage. After his disciples moaned, which they did a lot, about the difficulty of Jesus' teaching. <laughs> that's just too hard. It is. I'm not teasing them there. They said this. If that's the case, then it's better not to even marry. To which Jesus responded with this. Not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. And then it moves on. It's not like Jesus said, and oh my gosh, aren't they sinners, or terrible, or, you know, they just are. They're not a, did you say abomination? Yeah. Did I hear that word? Yeah, they're not Yep, and I really liked um, two paragraphs actually, and I am going to read them. Uh, 168, again, if you have the book, um, where Colby says, strikingly, what we do find is a barrier shattering story in Acts chapter 8. So, in Acts chapter 8, there's a story of a eunuch who is from Ethiopia, and he has been uh, reading the scriptures and he can, doesn't understand. And he asks um, Philip about that. So I'm going to go on with what Colby said and then we'll get to that. The kingdom of God, inaugurated in the life of Jesus, vindicated and initiated in his death and resurrection, is now being implemented by God's Spirit through the early church at a rapid rate. So included in that, okay, let's pause for a minute. We talked about that last week. So at this rapid rate of growth of the Christian church and the message of Jesus is this uh, also rapid rate of inclusion of all kinds of people that they just don't know how to deal with. Um, yeah, it's complicated and hard. Included in the implementation are moments, one right after another, where the early church has to come to grips with the inclusivity of the gospel. Like, who is it really for? Is it just for those Jews? And if you want to be following Jesus, you have to become a Jew first. And, and they are forced to see that the kingdom is open for everyone. So, the story in chapter 8 of Acts. Philip, following the leading of God's Spirit, finds himself in the presence of a eunuch from Ethiopia. Whether man-made or natural-born, we do not know, doesn't say. But, I, but he says, I don't think that's the point. That is true. <laughs> The point is that this new thing that God is doing through Jesus has broken through the wall of the sexual other. A category of people that were previously outsiders from a Jewish perspective. Indeed, eunuchs were not allowed. I don't believe eunuchs were allowed in the temple. They were not allowed to be part of the community uh, in a full sense that, that others were. Yet now, 
he says, through the witness of Philip, a eunuch has come into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So Philip talks to the guy, to the eunuch, I should say, and then uh, explains what he's been reading about and introduces him to Jesus. And he is baptized and his whole family. So I'm going to say this again, this sentence, and lead into it because I think it's powerful. Yet now, he said, through the witness of Philip, a eunuch has come into relationship with God through Jesus Christ and given the gift of baptism. He joins the red. I mean, that would have been hugely important and disturbing to some and knocked people's socks off and made them scratch their heads and say, what is happening? And then the eunuch joins the rest of the family at the table with zero words of condemnation. The story never condemns him in any way. That's just significant power. We have uh, <laughs> we've been waiting since last August. As a matter of fact, it's way before that. And you've heard me, it, you may have heard me mention before this event that's coming up, and it's now actually scheduled a post COVID week event, <laughs> uh, January 8th and 9th, Austin Hartke. Google him if you don't, you, know, you may not have ever heard of Austin. He's written a couple of books that are really good. He is a trans man. And, um, is a biblical scholar, has written books about the Bible and gender identity. He, bring, he will talk, I guarantee you, because I've heard him a couple of times, I've asked him to come to be with us. He's going to be here on Saturday evening, or Saturday afternoon, late afternoon, and Sunday, then he'll preach. Heart key is H A R T K E. So Austin is going to be here, um, and we're going to promote, you know, communicate that to the wider community. For people to come and hear about the Bible and gender identity, and he will talk about units um, for sure. And I just, I, it just gave me an opportunity to tell you more about that. And uh, I'm excited to hear uh, to hear him again and to share him, his story with you, so. because it's significant. The the presence of units in the scripture. That's not the only thing you'll talk about. But I'm saying you'll hear this again. So this is just. Anything else about that chapter or those passages in Corinthians and Timothy before we talk about the, the, I'd say the ending for the book of Colby's story, which I really do want to talk about too. So anything else we got to that? I just thought how it struck me that when I read that scripture from Matthew, um, how I had taken it to say, oh, this is why Catholic priests don't marry. And I have also heard it described as this is where that it was the kingdom of God was coming soon. So, you, mm -hmm. you know, so you, no need to marry. And, right. So, no need, it's you know, it's, it's kind of struck me as, oh, my gosh, maybe I need to read a lot more scripture and <laughs> a, lot, a lot more um, careful and work a little harder at digging out what's there because uh, that was, I was familiar with that scripture and never had any Yes, it was on a different level than what yeah. it was taken to. Yeah. Same. One thing that I found interesting in the explanation of what a eunuch is, the, the three things. Yeah. The second one is not aroused by women. It doesn't say not aroused by something else or not aroused at all. And so, I mean, it seems to me like a gay man could fit in that category mm -hmm. and be considered a eunuch. And, yes. then, and then eunuchs are you know, later on in the Acts situation or scenario, eunuchs are included. And yeah, with no judgment. With, the, with no judgment. 
And I think that you could interpret that across the board, not just gay men, but any or you know natural orientation. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, like I said, it, I really appreciate uh, Norman spending time on the concept that modern understanding of, of uh, gender and sexuality has no place in how we go to the biblical text because that's a, that's a very modern concept. Like contemporary to our life, modern. And so the biblical writers wouldn't have had any idea that that's how we see the world with each other. I just, I, I heard that distinction made a couple times when I was younger and then never heard anybody talk about it. So I really appreciate you spending time on that. Yeah, it, I think that's really important. So for me, you know, I, I thought about this at the end of this part of this journey. You know, uh, why do these kinds of things, you know, a year, well, however long it's been, <laughs> when we studied the Rob Bell book about the Bible, uh, why study the Bible, why study, uh, actually what we've done a lot is study about the Bible. And I think that is so important because when we create a space, or it's important to create a space to, um, to really unlearn some former ideas and that may have created harm or may have harmed others and to create this space where we can just honestly look at them and then possibly, well, hopefully replace them with fresh ideas and I'm going to use this word and I'm standing firmly on the, on the choice to do that um, and replace it with truth. That's one reason I would keep us talking like this, so that we have tools ourselves to both understand ourselves and maybe harm and try to help to undo harm that has been done for some of us, and then also to be able as allies, or you know, and, and even you know, all of us together, uh, have some some place to stand when we are confronted with this. <laughs> be able to say, you know, because um, there are folks, just last week, I had several emails from first, you know, who, um, they, they're struggling, I, this is one story, struggling with their own identity, and they know what, you know, they, they are, they'll, they'll take some steps ahead in understanding, like accepting themselves, um, and then other voices will come along that are familiar, and even in their, uh, you know, their their biological families, that undo that, or that makes it difficult again. So I think it's really important to be able to say, no, we talked about this, you know, I mean, it's not, the Bible is not condemning me, even though this person is trying to tell me that. You know, I understand that. You may never change the other person's mind, but you may be able stand in your true in true. So allies and everyone alike can have those tools. So thank you for going on this journey. <laughs> like you. Like I asked you. <laughs> 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 uh, all right. So Colby's story. Um, I think I recapped it last week some. I don't know who wasn't here, uh, but so Colby, evangelical church a couple weeks ago, uh, but that, that is beside the point. He was in a, a Christian church system that condemned uh, LGBTQ folks, and he, his own theology and biblical understanding started to change. And so he was confronted uh, by the church board about that uh, when he made a this, this public statement, and um, they fired him. So he was, looking, he was looking for a place to continue to be a pastor or to you know, do something in, in, along those lines with the congregation, 
And this chapter in 9 is about a church he founded with some other, what, about 21, exactly, he counts, I don't count, but 21 other people um, who uh, were interested in helping do that. So, any thoughts about, about that, those who did read it, and then as we get into that, those sharing, you know, you all sharing and me sharing, and then we can read some parts and catch other people up. So, any thoughts about chapter 9? Anything that resonated with you or that you said, wow, I'd like to be part of that? Or, <laughs> or, or, or. I think a lot of us did. Yes. <laughs> Does that resonate with you? What's that? Does that resonate with you? It resonates with me. <laughs> One of the reasons is they let you reserve them. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mason does not, and Deerfield Township does not. Um, so anyway, um, we, of people who had said, I'm interested in doing this for about 50. And, uh, you know, we had, I actually don't talk about this too much, because I really, we don't take attendance. It's not that people aren't important, but I don't want, it's my own discipline too, of, getting out of the, the institutional mindset that, that all, that's all that matters. And it's not, you know, and um, it's important, but it's not, it's not. Um, and so, which is why we're starting the weekly uh, tools for your everyday life, just to connect with people. If you are like, what's that? Check your email last Monday. <laughs> Every Monday about 6 a.m. you'll get something in your inbox that will be a tool for missional living on, on your everyday journey that week. So uh, it's just an affirmation that it is not all about what we do together when we get on here to on Sunday. But anyway, I don't talk about this too much because it's just not something that I want to make a big deal of. So I'm not now, but we have about, I'd say this week, uh, and it, it changes and grows all the time. Um, I think See, again, I didn't pay that much attention. Probably about 138 people in the database of folks who are connected in some way with uh, the open table. So that's just in, in two years today, last Sunday of June, that I left the United States Church. So I'm just grateful for what I've been able to watch happen. And when we first started talking about it, we didn't have a name, and we just called it that new thing God is doing. The new thing, TNT. <laughs> so. All right. Anybody else? Anyone else resonate with that? I just want to talk about it some or celebrate a little bit. So, Two-year mark. There was there was something in chapter ten that was not the Greek interpretation of the words and stuff that really resonated with me, and it relates it relates to what he probably had to say in his. Uh, journey to the, the church that he started. And and that was, what do you say when somebody says, well, so you believe homosexual is oh, that not part. a sin? Right. And his response to that, you know, what, well, do you believe heterosexual behavior is a sin? sin. And, you know, well, or heterosexuality, you know, heterosexuality itself, not or going to prostitutes if you're, if you're head, in right. a marriage with a, a, a woman, Right. So, and, and being able to respond that way, and, and it gave me some ideas of how do I approach what people do say, well, how can you believe that? Hmm. It's a sin, right. right? It says right there. Is it? Yeah. 
Yes. I'm yes. Gonna, I always talk all the time. I'm a talker. Talk. But I, I thought that book showed me a lot about how far my faith has come in my journey with the Lord. And it also showed me about, I guess, I guess the hypocritical kind of messages that are in, in the church kind of ingrained there from, I guess, mistruths yeah. that they've been, been void. And now that you told me about 1946, I just went through that. I'm like, you know, I just noticed that there's lots of trick that's going on in the church. And I feel like there, some people are using the Bible as a weapon to push their own personal agenda through political views and so forth. And I feel like the political views intertwine with the religious views, per se. And I feel like that's what they're projecting on you, but they're not actually taking a deeper dive and reading the passages slowly to understand the truth. And they're using it to hurt people instead of actually using it to be inclusive and loving and preaching the Ten Commandments and then preaching all the, all the positives of the Bible. I just feel like there's lots of room to grow. I feel like by just being ed sharing education and deeper dive and digs into the Bible rather than just using it to put themselves on a plateau of holiness and watching people suffer rather than lifting people up and then kind of preaching the word of God and how God would want you to lift the seats of others. This was just so much truth in the church environment. And I feel like this is a great book that we can start educating our brothers and sisters out there who may feel that way and share some wisdom with them and say, you know what, the LGBT community is just worthy of God's righteousness and love as a heterosexual community. And I think we don't need to tear one community down, and then, like, we have the heterosexual community up here, and the LGBTQ community up here, I feel like the, the people up here look down on this, but we're all the same in God's image, so we, we should all be level set, rather than division, there's just too much of that, too much, like a roller coaster. I feel like we should just see eye to eye with people and rise above differences and learn to be inclusive of and open-minded to different topics of the Bible energy. See why it's important to them to understand why these verses are written the way they are, maybe how, why they got translated that way. I don't know. That's where I'm thinking. That's where I'm thinking. That's a good kind of one. Okay. I'm not quite sure. Thank you. 
then as I began, the next big, huge step in my life was thinking about it and coming to a decision that we are all God's children. God loves all of us just the way we are and, you know, and all that. But where I wasn't able to function was to say in my church to the people that I worshiped with who made, you know, I, who, who had different feelings, I wasn't able to say, we should talk about that because I don't feel that way about it. I don't, I, you know, I'm, I want to go on this journey. I want more and I want to understand more and I don't think that's right. I wasn't, I just kept my countenance to myself and um, it took a long time to get past that and I can only imagine at this point in my life, it took me a long time to get behind, to move along this. I can't say that I really appreciate how hard it is for somebody in the LGBTQ community to make that journey. And, you know, anytime we can come alongside one another is victory, but we just need to keep trying to keep talking and keep educating one another and showing one another. And um, Open Table has a started before that, but Open Table has been tremendous in being able to provide that to all of God's children. Yes. I just kept thinking that, um, what was the book we read last, around last summer? The Flesh. Chapter? Flesh. Flesh. I kept thinking, like, kind of... Not what you think. Flesh is the gospel. <laughs> what previous people had said that how powerful it is just to dive a little bit deeper and kind of deconstruct some ideas that they've already had. Just that anyone who didn't read it, there was a chapter, and the author was like pretty evangelical, and he was talking about how um, the Supreme Court case of like the baker um, right. refused to make the cake for the gay couple, and this evangelical author went on to say like Jesus would have baked the cake um, because poor, like the point is really nitpicky. It's like, well, Baker should have made a cake for someone suffering from diabetes. Is that funny? Like, you right. should really get specific. And I think it, the only part that kind of like rubbed us all the wrong way was this book was written, I think, like previous same sex marriage becoming legal. Yeah. And he went on to say Jesus would only make a cake because he wanted to start like a conversation. But I've been thinking, like, if that author may have done like a little bit deeper in something like this, he was already on the right path. Yeah. He already thought that. It should be done because Jesus would love everyone, and he wouldn't bake the cake. It's just like a celebration, like it's a cake. Um, and I just kept thinking, I don't know why I kept going back to that, but, you know, how good of a tool this, even, not necessarily everyone deserves benefit of the doubt, but I think of people in my family that it's just so ingrained what is already taught, and even though it means that you're going to talk about homosexuality in the Bible, so people don't like even think that, oh, maybe this translation is a little bit off. Right, no, that would be very threatening to them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just kept thinking back to so many people are like, almost there that they even just dug a little deeper, how much more like, welcoming and um, like, you know, opening to the other people's journey. Yeah. Colby says about uh, the new church that he started with his folks. When the service begins, you might wonder, when is everyone going to find their seats? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this thing starting? Trust us, we think that too sometimes. But eventually, people will peel off from their conversations and make their way to chairs. Or they won't, which is fine. Then you might notice, no scratch that, you will absolutely notice that there are children. Lots of them everywhere. Now, I thought pre-pandemic, you know, we have lots of kids at the open table who just had not been around so much because of lots of things. I talked to their parents and connect with them, but you know, there's uh, the pandemic during school year, just overwhelming. And to, to think of one more thing to try to get on Zoom about, you know, is just hard. And why you can't grab kids on Zoom. And the park is awesome, except the playground, which we thought, that's so neat. 
yeah, unless you bring your kids, and then you spend your time over there, so they might as well play at home. Anyway, it's just, it's just a bit of a challenge, so I'm looking forward to them coming back. But he says this, um, then you will notice that there are children, lots of them everywhere. Some are up toward the front of the room, sitting or dancing or spinning in <laughs> circles on the giant area rugs. And I thought of Bobby Tyson, who some of you do not know, but others who just would literally do that. And dance and spin around in her princess gown. Yeah. So, um, anyway, uh, it, it goes on. I just thought that was cool. All right. Um, for communion today, we're going to, to share at the table. And um, what I'm going to do is actually. I'm going to do a hybrid version of surgery. So I'm going to hand you these. And then you're going to go back to the table where you're sitting at or wherever you are. And you can eat the bread and the juice on your own. Just whenever you're ready to do that. I'll just give a little instruction again in case you have trouble or have a figure. Uh, the, there's a little thin cellophane layer that will get you to what they call the bread. And then there's a bigger tab that will open underneath that that will get you to choose it. Right. And I'll wear a mask during that time if it makes anybody feel more comfortable. But whether you do it will or not, I will wear a mask. <laughs> oh God, in the loving and liberating spirit of Jesus, we gather at this welcoming table open to all. Remembering how Jesus gathered people from all the walks of life, stranger, friend, and enemies. He gave thanks to you, offered all the bread of life and the cup of blessing, and proclaimed the covenant of love for all in your name. On this week, our church emphasizes loving others. We remember, too, the wonder of, of his life as we remember the wonder of all of creation given to us and how all are one. We remember the agony of Jesus' death and all the terrors and the cruelties that oppress people today. And we remember the power of resurrection, the mystery of faith, and the everlasting spirit, the triumph of our fear. Help us to remember to practice resurrection every day, as we remember all those who have given love, the ultimate trust, and the last word, and who have worked to create the beloved community of renewed and abundant life. Help us to remember with this meal, especially all those who are hungry, and may we treat all our meals as sacred and to be shared. Take us, bless us, so that even in and with our brokenness, we may serve others. Jesus said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. In prison and you came to me. And they said, Lord, when, we, when did we do this? And he said, you did this for me when you did it for the least of these. So here is the bread of life, food for the Spirit. Let all who hunger come and eat. And the fruit of the body, pressed and poured out for us. Let all who thirst now come and drink. We come to make peace. We come to be restored in the love of God. We come to be made new as instruments of that love in Jesus all are worthy all are loved so I thank you to come forward and receive today God have you
said hi to the people before. So, hi, people. So we're glad you're with us. Uh, everybody say hi, Dan and family. And hi, Dan. Dan. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. All right. So there is a benediction that uh, the church that Colby refers to uses. And uh, I have, since I read this a oh, months ago, I've been thinking about this. And um, it may become ours. It's not unique to them. So we could seal it, and it is not unique. There's no problem. <laughs> so I will prompt you with what I want you to say. So as you go, be brave. And say, because you're a child of God, because you are a child of God. And then I'll say, and be kind, because so is everyone else. All right, let's try it again. Be brave, because you are a child of God. And be kind, because so is everyone else.